Friends and travelers, however you've arrived, I bid you welcome. Here at Let's Be Frank, we're about lives, and above all, living well. I don't suspect a podcast hosted by Benjamin Franklin could be about anything else. In my lifetime, I pursued the practice of moral improvement like a science, recording my successes, and yes, oftentimes reveling in my failings. It's my genuine hope, with our weekly almanac, to feed to a curious world delicious morsels of history in quick and concise installments, perfect for a nice sit in your favorite chair, a morning walk to work. At the end of each installment, I like to wrap it all up in a neat little parcel with a lesson you can apply to your own life, inspired by the events, personalities, and ideas covered in each episode. So sit back, relax, and together, let's make history. Greetings and salutations, dear listener. Welcome to another installment of Let's Be Frank, an auditory almanac for the curious mind with me, your faithful friend and host, Dr. Benjamin Franklin, printer. A special thank you to the members of our Patreon junto who came out to this November's Coffeehouse Q&A with co-creator of Let's Be Frank, Master Brian Austin. A reminder to all of our listeners that these Q&As happen once a month and are available for members of the Penny Philosopher tier and up of our Patreon. Love the wit and wisdom of Let's Be Frank? Join our Patreon junto today and help us make history come alive. That's all the announcements we have for today, so let's rush quickly into today's installment. For purposes of good order, this podcast is composed of several sources associated with Ben Franklin's life, knit together to collect it all into one narrative on a cohesive theme. Today's episode is the second part of our interview with Mistress Megan Cantwell, an apprentice silversmith with the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation. Last week, we discussed women in trades and the ancient art of silversmithing. We're going to pick up the interview where we left off, but first, to reacquaint ourselves with Mistress Cantwell. An unrepentant nerd, Megan is an apprentice historic silversmith and small business owner. When she's not at heavy metal shows, she's playing video games, mainly Zelda or The Witcher 3, marathoning the Lord of the Rings trilogy, making silver jewelry, baking crazy cakes, spoiling her ridiculous cat, or feeding the local crows. There's a great amount of that biography, madam, that I do not understand, but I do relate to feeding crows. All the same, we welcome you back to Let's Be Frank, and we're excited to continue the conversation. Hello. Madam Cantwell, last week we spoke predominantly about the history of the trade of silversmithing, particularly the history of women in trades, their role in society. This week, I thought we would focus a little bit more on the 21st century, uh, particularly your experience. Now, what is it like to explore history this way? The world is filled with people who choose to explore the past with ink, letters, and books. What is it like exploring the past with hammers and silver? What is it about it that surprised you most? Um, mostly it just comes down to, I had never worked with metal before. My background is in, uh, 2D and 3D animation, experimental sound design and video. Uh, so physically working with the material is really nice, but I wasn't expecting how easily silver would move. Uh, it's the second most malleable metal. Gold is the first. We work both, uh, as silversmiths. If you can do one or the other, you'll work them. Uh, but it's just surprising how it wants to move, how you can manipulate it. Uh, you still, of course, need hammers and things, but uh, it's just a lot of fun to get it to take its place where you want it to be. Now, in a more broader sense, what have you learned by exploring the past in this way? How has modern silversmithing using older methods informed you of the experiences of those whose lives and experiences you've examined in your research? Uh, when it comes down to it, there's not a lot of silversmiths left anymore. 
uh, at least in the Western world. Uh, you still see a lot of these practices being practiced in places like India uh, still to this day, uh, oftentimes with the same tools and uh, somewhat similar techniques. But what surprised me most is uh, how people assume that silversmithing is just jewelry. Uh, there are different subsets to silversmithing. Uh, raising hollowware technically is what a silversmith does, is you're using a hammer as your primary tool to shape that material. Jeweler can be argued to be a separate trade. Mm. Uh, you're setting stones, you're working with smaller pieces, it's not so much hammering, uh, so it's often a subset of silversmithing. Uh, in my work, in my apprenticeship, I have to learn to do it more than anyone silversmith of the 18th century would have known. So from small works, uh, the jewelry pieces, all the way up to large works like monteiths and punch bowls. Uh, but oftentimes people are surprised that uh, it's not just jewelry <laughs> that a silversmith makes. Now, in all of your workings, is there one object that sticks out to you as a, as a favorite or a, a challenging piece that you worked on? Do, do you have an all-time favorite object that you've made? Uh, so far, it's uh, a fish trowel. So I haven't finished it yet. It's getting very close. But it's a serving utensil for fried or poached fish. It looks like a giant cake server. Uh, so a big triangle, and it has a lot of designs uh, pierced into it. So drilling holes, feeding a saw blade through the hole, and then cutting it out. Uh, saw piercing is one of my favorite techniques, and many jewelers and many silversmiths today still actually do this the same way. Same jeweler saw even that was invented in the early 1700s has not changed. It's on everyone's bench. Uh, so that's one of my favorite things. Uh, it's basically, yeah, just a fancy uh, cake server looking thing, uh, but it's getting close to being done, and hopefully I'll have uh, another project on the works after that. Mistress Cantwell did provide an image of the project she's working on. We've taken the liberty of sharing it on our Patreon page as a special extra for the members of our Patreon junto. Now, Madam Cantwell, what is it like being a tradesperson and artisan in the 21st century? Are there any similarities with the craft practiced 200 years ago and how you go about practicing it today? As far as how you do business, as far as how you interact with the wider world. Uh, so some of the similarities just come down to the tooling. So like with the jeweler's saw, it's still very much the same. Uh, the drill has changed. You can still get upright or pump drills from the time period uh, today, and you can still do that by hand if you want, but most people will use like a flex shaft or a Dremel, uh, but the actual act of hand cutting it out is still very much the same. Uh, raising the act of hammering up uh, items has changed, and that changed actually in the very early 1800s. So it used to be for basically thousands of years, you'd start with a flat disc of silver, hold it at different angles against your anvil, and hammering in a circle starting from the center and moving to the edge, you would do that repeatedly, and it would take a flat 2D piece and raise it eventually up and into a 3D form. Sort of like watching a potter throw a clay on a wheel. They gather their hands together, they gather the clay and move it into shape. We do that with a hammer. Uh, but that was replaced in the early 1800s with spinning on a metal lathe. Uh, up until that point, lathes weren't powerful enough to shape metal, but in the early 1800s, they were. I'm not sure the exact date that one is patented. I think it's 1833, either in England or America. I think it's England, and that's still how it's made today. So if you get a piece of modernly made hollowware, it's actually spun as a disc on an industrial lathe, and you're using tools to push it against a wooden form. So it's still that same spinning, but because you're not wasting a bunch of time where the hammer's not actually touching the tool, it gets done incredibly quickly and therefore cheaper. So most people today don't hand raise all that much. Now where could our listeners go to find you, as well as some of the things that you make? So I do have uh, Instagram under Zelda Sigrun, and I also have an Etsy page. Uh, I have my own small business that I just started called The Lady of the Lake Silver. Uh, and I do work for the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation at the Sign of the Golden Ball, uh, James Craig's silversmith shop. Fascinating. Uh, are there any books that you recommend? Uh, should anyone wish to, to learn more about 
18th century trades, women in trades, or just uh, women in the past? Uh, so there's a couple of books out there. One that I just really enjoy just for fun is Death by Petticoat, which kind of uh, busts a lot of myths of the time period. But in terms of actually silversmithing, um, when it comes down to learning more about the trade itself as it's practiced today and ways that haven't really changed. One of the books when it comes down to actually making uh, pieces and is relevant today and was written modernly is The Complete Metalsmith by Tim McCrate. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, there's a lot of information in there that is applicable to both 18th century and modern practices of the trade, because the metal itself doesn't really change. Uh, but there's a solid amount of information in there. Uh, and oftentimes, I believe, if you're taking a college class, this will be reading. Uh, and one book that I've been reading through right now, which deals more with the 18th century, is uh, Women Silversmiths. And basically, it's 1685 to 1845. Uh, Philippa Glanville, I believe, is the author of this book. Uh, yes, and it has a huge wealth of information, and it goes into a lot of the, the guild records and all of this, because one of the things I very often get modernly, uh, whether it's when I'm at my job or in my own time at home uh, posting, is women didn't do this trade. and there's verifiable evidence all over that women are in this trade. Not as much as men, but they are. And this book is a great jumping off point for finding out more about specific women that are registered in the Guild Hall in England. Of course. Uh, now, the final question I have is one that I ask all of my guests. Now, what is it about studying history that sets you on fire? I've always liked to learn how to make things. Uh, so that was my initial draw in into the, the trade, into starting an apprenticeship here. Uh, but as I've worked uh, and learned more, it's been finding out about the stories of people who were underrepresented in history, because we all know the great names of people like Washington and Jefferson, because a lot of their works survive, a lot of their diaries, a lot of their writings, uh, they're talked about most often, but it's the average everyday people, the working poor, and then the middle class who aren't talked about very often. So finding out their stories uh, is incredibly interesting to me because poor people have had to work throughout human history no matter where you are. The poorer you are, the more likely it is you have to work. So it really comes down to, you know, finding out more about women who were working in these trades uh, men who were working in these trades and how they were forgotten about or oftentimes pushed aside because they didn't have the time to write about their daily life. So oftentimes the only thing that survives is a piece they made uh, and trying to connect that back to whatever evidence is still existing that we can find. A remarkable answer. Madam Catwell, thank you for joining us over the course of these past two episodes. Thank you so much for having me. Now, we'll stick around and speak for a little while longer, but let's bid farewell to our junto and be off. Now, my dear friends, what lesson can we derive from part two of this interview with Megan Cantwell? Now, Miss Cantwell studies the past through physical objects left behind. A great many of those objects that she's studied are all that remains of those individuals who toiled their entire lives to learn that craft. Their legacy left not in ink and ledgers, but instead into the silver that they shaped. A lifetime of learning distilled into something precious and worthwhile. Now, In that, I'm reminded of the lesson for today. We all, over the course of our lives, leave behind a litany of words, phrases, and sentiments. And yet, at day's close, it is our actions that are the true product of our worth and measure of our worthiness. We may not all leave behind items of silver, but those acts of virtue that we pour into each other's life are treasures all the same. 
Uh, so the lesson for today, my beloved Junto, is that well done is better than well said. That's all for today's installment. Would that we had more hours in the day, but as always, we have nothing but time between us. Resource materials and images from this week's episode can be found in the journal section at www.bfranklinlive.com. If you like the show, subscribe and stay up to date with all the latest gossip and news, and do me the kindness of leaving a review. You can follow us on Facebook at Let's Be Frank and Instagram at Be Franklin Live. And finally, dear listener, spread the word. Tell your family, tell your neighbors, tell your horse, I don't care. Let's make our intellectual junto grow. And now, dear listeners, our time together must come to an end. Fare thee well, and always remember, when you're good to others, you are best to yourself. Until we meet again, I remain your humble and obedient servant, Dr. Benjamin Franklin, printer. Stay curious, my friends. 